Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 23 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we give you the deep dive into June 1968, including the various club jam sessions and the recording the Electric Ladyland album. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period. By June 1968, with Chaz Chandler out of the picture, Hendrix had settled into a pattern. Daytime sessions were for cutting tracks with Eddie Kramer, while evening sessions soon became Jimmy's after-hours retreat, a place where he and his friends could jam and capture their ideas on tape. Jamming was Hendrix's principal source of inspiration, and while Chandler would bristle at the idea of wasting expensive studio time, Hendrix had no such concern. According to Hendrix author John McDermott, the night sessions gave Jimmy an opportunity to stretch out, a safe haven where his ideas could be developed in a relaxed atmosphere. Tony Bongiovi, an engineer at the record plant, recalled, Hendrix would be booked for a 7 p.m. session, and 7 p.m. would come and go. I'd sit there and doze off until he and his entourage would come back from the scene club. Then they'd usually be totally ripped, gone out the window with drink. Monday, the 1st of June, 1968 and the Jimi Hendrix experience departs from Zurich Airport for England. Jimi arrives at Heathrow Airport in London with Yvonne Gerhard, a 14-year-old girl who won the Neuer Press newspaper competition, which allowed her to fly from Zurich to London in the company of Jimi Hendrix. Also on the 1st of June, the experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers. New Musical Express, where the Smash Hits album is charting at number 6 on the top 15 LPs list. Record Mirror with the Smash Hits album sitting at number 10 on the top LPs chart, along with an article about the Miami Pop Festival, and Disc and Music Echo, which featured the Smash Hits album sitting at number 5 on the top 10 LPs chart. Thursday, the 4th of June, sees the experience rehearse their upcoming recordings for Dusty Springfield's television program, It Must Be Dusty, at the ITV studios in Borehamwood, Hertfordshire. The show followed the BBC format with songs, live performances with a small orchestra led by Jack Parnell, and music guests including the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Manfred Mann, Donovan, Julie Felix, and brother Tom Springfield. Also on the 4th, I Magazine, number 4, is published featuring photos of Jimmy and Noel. Friday the 5th of June, It Must Be Dusty, ITV, Elstree Studios, Studio D, Borehamwood Performing Stone Free, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, and Mockingbird, to which Jimmy and Dusty Springfield sing a duet. The 15 minutes of recordings of the show were then broadcast on July 12, 1968. According to Mitch, we guested on the Dusty Springfield show, which wasn't bad. Jimmy and Dusty duetted on Mockingbird, the only time we ever did the song. While Noel recalled, it was a warm, relaxed show, but Jimmy insisted on playing with his teeth. I hated it when he did that. It put my teeth on edge. Even the producer wasn't too aloof to get mangled with us afterwards. Then we went to a party at some sir's house, where there were all kind of weird scenes going on. Sunday the 7th of June, flight to New York. Hendrix, Mitchell and Redding travel from London to New York then. Monday the 8th of June. Hendrix is a guest at the Fillmore East in New York with the Electric Flag who are performing two shows. Jimmy participates in a jam session with the Electric Flag who are on the program, along with the Joshua Light Show, Quicksilver and Steppenwolf. Jimmy will perform South Saturn Delta and Hey Joe with Buddy Miles doing vocals, all of which he will record with his portable tape recorder. What did Buddy Miles say about Hendrix? Then 20 years of age, Buddy Miles admired Hendrix a great deal. This is what he had to say. I had a deep fascination for the man and I wanted to learn, he said. We kidded around a lot, but there was a real harmony between us. He had a charm and grace about him. When I first met him in 1965 at the Grand National at Montreal, he had his hair in a ponytail with long sideburns. Even though he was shy, I could tell this guy was different. Miles openly emulated Hendrix, joining his tight-knit social circle and befriending the likes of Faye Prigdian and the Allen Twins. Moving flats and Georg Friedrich Handel, according to Kathy Etchingham, my relationship with Jimmy is finished, Chaz told me furiously. I'm no longer his manager, so you'll have to find somewhere else to live. We haven't got anywhere to go, I protested. That's your problem, he snapped, obviously wanting nothing more to do with us. Not knowing where to start, I went around to a local estate agent and explained that I had to find a flat to rent in central London. 
Is this for you? The agent inquired. Yes, I said, for me and my boyfriend, Jimi Hendrix. Oh my God. The man put his head into his hands. If you want something anywhere around Mayfair and this area, you're going to have trouble. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. The moment it's known who you are, residents' associations will hold meetings and decide that they don't want a pop star living in their building because of the trouble you're likely to bring with you. They just imagine loud music and drug busts and streams of girls hanging around outside with autograph books. I went to look at a few places with him, all of them very expensive, but he was quite right. No one wanted us. Jimmy had become a star and everyone had heard of him. His flamboyant image was too powerful. These people would never have believed me, even if I told them what a quiet, gentle man he could be when he was at home. The other problem I had was that I had no idea how much Jimmy could afford or what his management would be willing to pay. I just knew I had to sort something out before he arrived home in England. I went back to Chaz and told him I couldn't find anything. After contacting a friend who did some searching on her behalf, a flat was located in Brook Street just round the corner from Bond Street and Claridge's, and after meeting with the leaseholder, Cathy promptly agreed to take it. The rent was £30 a week, which was a lot of money in 1968, but it was just what we needed, and by this stage I couldn't have cared less about the cost. Chaz and Jimmy had put me in this position, and they would just have to pay and sort it out between them. I had to have somewhere to live, and I decided this would be it. What really tickled us was that Georg Friedrich Handel had lived there. There was a plaque in his honour on the front of the house. It was later we found out he had actually lived next door. It seemed fitting that Jimmy, one of the greatest musicians of his day, should live in the same style. There were other parallels between them. Not only were they both musicians, they had both come to England from their own countries in order to find recognition and build international careers. Also on June 8th, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers, New Musical Express, where the Smash Hits album is charting at number 8 on the top 15 LPs list. Record Mirror, where the Smash Hits album is number 4 on the top LPs chart. And Melody Maker, where Smash Hits sits at number 4 on the top 10 LPs chart. Wednesday the 10th of June, at the record plant, New York City. Mixes and overdubs for House Burning Down, Voodoo Child, and 1983, A Merman I Should Turn To Be. And recording, Rainy Day. Dream Away and Still Raining, Still Dreaming with Mike Finnegan on organ, Buddy Miles on drums, Freddie Smith on sax and Larry Fawcett on congas. In the studio, according to John McDermott for Eddie Kramer, one of the secrets of keeping Hendrix focused was by challenging him to do something differently, be it immediately following a take or later in a session when, after Hendrix might create a sound or style, Kramer would suggest adding it to a previous recording. Their many sessions at Olympic had created a strong, unspoken bond between them. A host of different ideas were tried, including small and large horn sections, as well as the spacious sound painting created for 1983, A Mermaid I Should Turn to Be. At the record plant on June 10, 1968, Hendrix busied himself recording a number of new tracks, including Rainy Day, Dream Away, and Still Raining, Still Dreaming. These two tracks were recorded as one, then split by Hendrix and Kramer during the later mixing sessions. Mike Finnegan, organist on the session, said that, Having heard the first two albums, I thought we'd be using stacks and stacks of amplifiers and toys to get Jimmy's sound. To get the right guitar tone for Rainy Day, Dream Away and Still Raining, Still Dreaming, he was using the small, blonde, 30-watt Fender Showman amplifier. We couldn't believe it. Two of the wonderfully exotic compositions that fill Electric Ladyland Rainy Day, Dream Away, and Still Raining, Still Dreaming. Mark Drummer Buddy Miles' first contribution to the Hendrix canon. Much to the usurped Mitch Mitchell's credit, Miles had become a regular visitor to the record plant and was accepted gracefully. According to Eddie Kramer, 1983 came together during the mixing process where overdubs as simple as the sounds of crying seagulls were improvised on the spot. He explained... By cupping earphones over the microphone during the playback of an overdub, Hendrix and Kramer were struck by the short peal of feedback. Within minutes, with delay added to dramatize the squeal, the effect became part of the collage. The final mixing session for 1983 was a performance in itself. The panning, the fading and additional sound effects, stemming a continuous flow of ideas and a joint decision to make this song free from edits. Considered to be one of Electric Ladyland's most memorable performances, 
This gentle ethereal ballad best emphasized Hendrix's abstract vision. Thursday the 11th of June at the Record Plant, doing studio recordings, focus jam inside out, an early Easy Y Rider attempt, and drum solo, a freeform guitar and drum jam. Also, Steppenwolf spent four evenings at the Scene Club in New York with Mose Allison and Kenny Rankin on the program. During one of these evenings, Jimmy joined the band for a jam session with Buddy Miles, drums, and Mike Finnegan on keyboards. Friday the 12th of June, Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell travel to Mallorca, Spain, with Kathy Etchingham, Angie Burden, Jerry Stickles, and Neil Landon. According to Mitch, shortly after the Zurich thing, we managed a few days off in Mallorca, where Mike Jeffrey had always maintained an apartment. he just opened a club called Sergeant Peppers, financed by us and his other acts, though we didn't know that at the time. Very nice. I think we played on the opening night. Nothing serious. Noel playing guitar, Jimmy on bass, that sort of thing. While Noel recalled, Neil, Eric, Kathy Etchingham, Angie Burden, Mitch, Jerry, Chaz and Lottie, who was living in Jeffrey's apartment, and I, headed to Mallorca. Jeffrey's Spanish interests were widespread. I could go to any club for free, jam wherever and whenever I felt like it, especially the Heimer Club, and even draw money from his tills. George Best was there with a gang of English footballers. It was a mad whirl of booze and girls. Saturday, the 13th of June, at the record plant, working on house burning down and gypsy eyes, then a photo session with photographer Richard Davis. Later, Jimmy jams with Jeff Beck at the Reality House Rehabilitation Center. Also on the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the Village Voice newspaper. Sunday, the 14th of June, and another day at the record plant working on South Saturn Delta, with horns. Electric Ladyland, have you ever been to Electric Ladyland? as well as, and the gods made love. In the following images note that, the person standing on the right is arranger Larry Fallon, and the trumpeter is Joe Newman. And on the same day, at the Drake Hotel in New York City, Jimmy is interviewed by Albert Goldman, with photos by Ros Kelly for the New York Magazine, published September 2nd, 1968. Monday the 15th of June, jam with Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton at the Scene Club. Jimmy and his girlfriend Fane Pridgen are photographed in front of the Apollo Theater at New York. They pose together in front of the Jackie Wilson concert poster. Most likely, they attended the Jackie Wilson Review with James Carr, Barbara Acklin, Ollie and the Nightingales, Slappy White and Big Maybell. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers, Record Mirror Magazine, Disc and Music Echo, and Melody Maker. Tuesday the 16th of June, Jam with Jeff Beck Group at the Daytop Music Festival, Staten Island. The Daytop Under the Stars Music Festival raises money for the Rehabilitation Center in New York, which supports drug addict rehabilitation. Later, Jimmy performs with jazz flautist Jeremy Steig at the Scene Club in New York. Ringo Starr and his wife Maureen are present. Apparently, Ringo refused to pick up the sticks to participate in this jam session. Also, Jimmy is interviewed for Cashbox magazine which will be published the 29th of June. The Daytop Music Festival, Under the Stars event, took place between June 14th to 17th, 1968, and featured Pete Seeger, Duke Ellington, Janice Ian, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Hugh Masakala, and the Grateful Dead, who had to cancel their appearance on the 16th. The reason for the Dead's exit is unknown, but the Jeff Beck group agreed to be a last-minute addition. However, as it turned out, Rod Stewart's voice was shot, so instead Jimi Hendrix on guitar, filled in for initially both Beck and Stewart, backed by Ron Wood on bass and Mickey Waller on drums, before Beck eventually joined in. According to Jeff Beck in an interview, Hendrix is the best jam I've ever had. Somebody organized the most monster jam of all, not from a status point of view. It really worked out perfectly. It was a concert for reformed drug addicts, but that was the least of it. They were fantastic people, they just sat for two hours and Jimmy played. He was playing bass, and he played a couple of my things. It just went on and on. We were jumping all over the place. The following is an excerpt from an article titled When Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck Held a Secret Jam, Staten Island, New York, and it was June 16, 1968, and America was in turmoil. Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated ten days before. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. had been felled by an assassin's bullet in Memphis on April 4th. Rage at the Vietnam War was burning all across the country. But on Staten Island, a little-known piece of rock and roll history was made featuring two of the greatest guitarists 
who've ever lived. The scene was the four-day, under the stars, benefit concert for the Daytop Village Drug Rehabilitation Center. The festival was held from Friday, June 14th to Monday, June 17th, and featured more than two dozen folk, jazz and rock performers, including superstars Pete Seeger, Duke Ellington, The Grateful Dead and Blood, Sweat and Tears. The Friday, Saturday and Sunday sessions were held outside at Daytop's former location in Prince's Bay. Monday's concert, featuring Ellington, was held at the Village Gate Club in Manhattan's Greenwich Village. It was on the Sunday that guitar gods Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck jammed. Hendrix was already rock royalty, having released his seminal Are You Experienced album the year before. Later in 1968, Hendrix would release Electric Ladyland, cementing his status as the greatest guitarist in rock history. The iconic Beck, the former Yardbird who is also considered by many to be rock's top guitarist, appeared at the festival with his own Jeff Beck group. The band featured Rod Stewart on vocals and guitarist Ron Wood, later of the Rolling Stones, who played bass in the Beck group. The Jeff Beck group was making its US touring debut that month, including New York gigs at the historic Fillmore East and five nights of jams with Hendrix at the scene. But as Beck told Guitar World in 2014, time was also made for a secret gig with Hendrix on Staten Island. Around that time, Jimmy and I played a secret gig, a benefit, at Drug Rehabilitation Center, Daytop Village. Jimmy drove me up in his Corvette. That was the best moment. His driving was terrible. We were stuck in traffic in the middle of New York City, and he had this brand new 427 Corvette boiling over, and I thought, I hope it doesn't blow up right here. Laughs. I was thinking, why did you buy a Corvette in Manhattan? Wood, who is also well known for his paintings of fellow rock icons, would later do a portrait of himself and Hendrix playing at the scene club. In a description of the painting on the San Francisco Art Exchange website, Wood wrote, I played with Jimmy on stage a few times in New York. We did this outdoor gig on Staten Island, and I also played with him at Steve Paul's scene on 46th Street. It was all during my days with the Jeff Beck group. Wood said, Jimmy used to convince Jeff to give me solos. He'd say, hey, let the bass player play. He was very generous. Wood also writes about the Island Jam in his 2007 autobiography, Ronnie. If Jimmy was in the same town as the Jeff Beck group, which often ended up being in New York, we would jam with him, Wood wrote. We did the Staten Island Festival together. Wednesday 17th and Thursday, the 18th of June saw Jimmy at the record plant, working on Gypsy Eyes. While on Friday the 19th of June, Jimmy participates in a jam session at the Scene Club with Buddy Miles, the Jeff Beck group, including Ron Wood and Mickey Waller. Also, at some point that day, the experience is interviewed for Hit Week edition number 43, which is published July 11th, 1968. Monday the 22nd of June, and Jimmy jams with Larry Coriel at the Scene Club. Also on this date, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers. Melody Maker, featuring the Smash Hits album sitting at number 7 on the top 10 LPs chart, New Musical Express with Smash Hits at number 6, Top Pops and Rolling Stone magazine. Wednesday the 24th of June. In New York, Jimmy signs several business agreements. One of the contracts ends PPX's lawsuit against Hendrix, as well as between Yametta and Capitol Records. It can truly be said that Hendrix's entire future was affected by this lawsuit and the settlement between Warner Brothers and Ed Chalpin. During the 1968 American tour, Hendrix proved a major asset, and his albums outsold those of Frank Sinatra and Dean Martins. Warner Brothers chairman Mo Austin discovered over lunch in New York that Hendrix's legal situation was more complicated than he knew, and that Jimmy had not signed directly at Warner, but with Yametta, who were contracted to provide Jimmy's musical output. As soon as Warner's 14 lawyers realized this, a settlement was reached almost immediately with Chalpin. This contract records this agreement, terminating the legal action brought by PPX against Hendrix, as well as that between Yametta and Capitol Records. PPX assigned to Warner all of its rights, as originally held in the infamous 1965 contract signed by Jimmy, but agreeing to pay PPX royalties until 1972, and stipulating that an album featuring new material was to be produced with proceeds going to PPX, namely the album Band of Gypsies. According to Noel, the case had almost come to court when Warner Brothers and Reprise offered to step in and settle the mess. They would sort out Chalpin and Jeffrey in one fell swoop by negotiating some of Jimmy Wright's in exchange for paying off Chalpin. The result was the signing of three documents. One, 
Settlement Agreement between PPX et al. and Jeffrey and Chandler. 2. Sale Agreement. Jeffrey and Chandler sold Jimmy to Warner Brother Reprise. 3. Warner Brother Reprise Recording and Production Contract with Jimmy, which superseded the original contract of March 1967. In exchange for PPX contract with Jimmy, Warner's offered Chalpin a two-point royalty on Are You Experienced and Axis, as well as the yet-to-be-released or even fully recorded Electric Ladyland. The guaranteed income on these three albums was $200,000, or $1 million according to your source, although estimates of its eventual value is as high as $4 million. In addition, Chalpin was given rights to another album by Jimmy, which turned out to be Band of Gypsies on Capitol. Despite these generous blandishments, Chalpin in addition packaged, released, repackaged and re-released some 14 albums consisting of pre-experience, Hendrix recordings. Friday the 26th of June and the Jimi Hendrix experience are featured in Go Set Magazine and Construire Underground Newspaper. Saturday the 27th of June and the experience is featured in The Village Voice, 21, the 27th of June edition and Super Love, the June 1968 edition. Sunday, June 28, 29, 30, 1968. The Jimi Hendrix experience had been booked to perform at the Carousel Ballroom, however the concerts were cancelled as the Carousel Ballroom had become bankrupt earlier in the month. Jimi Hendrix, along with B.B. King and The Move, were supposed to play three nights at the Carousel Ballroom. Sunday, the 28th of June, final mixes for Rainy Day Dream Away are prepared at the record plant. It is decided that two separate songs can be created from this recording, resulting in the original track being split into Rainy Day Dream Away and Still Raining, Still Dreaming. Later, Jimmy attends The Soul Together, a charity concert for the Martin Luther King Memorial Fund. Being held at Madison Square Garden, NYC in addition, Jimmy offers a check for $5,000 to the foundation. Monday the 29th of June, at the record plant, working on And the Gods Made Love. Also on this date, the experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers. Top Pops, New Musical Express with the Smash Hits album sitting at number 6 on the Top 15 LPs chart, and Melody Maker with Smash Hits at number 7. Well, needless to say, Jeffrey still remains a polarizing figure in the Hendrix story. Hendrix author, John McDermott, described him as follows. In business, Jeffrey trusted few, while trusted by even fewer himself, but he was far from a tyrant thief many writers have painted him. More cunning than given credit for, Jeffrey was a master negotiator, who unlike his famous client, never backed away from confrontation. His callous disregard of Hendrix's friends and sidemen, from Noel Redding to Buddy Miles, made him few friends. According to John Hillman, Yometa director and Mike Jeffrey's attorney, Jeffrey made it clear that Hendrix was the only artiste Yometa was to sign and receive a share. In his mind, other musicians were simply employees. What people like Noel Redding couldn't understand was that he was not a partner. Jeffrey wasn't the only one who had signed the contracts. Hendrix knew perfectly well who was getting what, but he could finger Jeffrey as the bad guy, just as Jeffrey could point to Yamita. Mike Jeffrey longed for the respect accorded his American mentors, Alan Klein, one-time Rolling Stones manager, and Albert Grossman, business manager at one time for Dylan Joplin and others, privately admiring Klein's ferocity and Grossman's paternal aura. Arguably, though, he deserved a place among them, having orchestrated one of the most profitable careers in rock music history, but the accolades never followed him. John Hillman recalled that Jeffrey was a lovable rogue. He begged, borrowed, and stole just to keep his artists going, but his return was only financial. They were his investments, and he was entitled to recoup. While Michael Goldstein explained, Jeffrey would stop at nothing to ensure the success of his artists, but he couldn't relate to them personally. Similarly, Bob Levine considered that Jeffrey was a brilliant visionary. He was a great person for spotting an artist's potential, literally saying, I can see us doing this. The problem was that, while he had an eye for raw talent, he couldn't be bothered to follow through on their careers. Hendrix was always his foremost concern, and after he'd secured his latest discovery, a fantastic advance from a record company, the group would be dumped in my lap and sent to open for the experience. While Hendrix authors... Harry Shapiro and Am P. Caesar Glebeek emphasized Jeffrey's more sinister reputation with this fascinating historical observation. After the Second World War, the Mafia, in particular New York's Anastasia family, latched onto jukeboxes as a source of revenue and again had a significant role in popular music history, 
by spreading southern R&B north of the Mason-Dixon line. Anastasia controlled both the location of jukeboxes and what music was played in them. Given the extent of criminal involvement in most aspects of the American leisure industry and the amount of money generated by rock, it would have been surprising if organized crime had not secured a piece of the action. From the 60s onwards, crime syndicates in America controlled venue blue-collar workers through the Teamsters Union, trucking and stadium concessions, to the point where it was said that nobody toured America without making arrangements, first to ensure the shows were staged and the gear didn't end up in Alaska. The Mafia have also been implicated in payola scandals, but the degree to which they have actually controlled record companies is open to question. Indirect association abound, however, and this brings us right back to Jimmy, or rather, Mike Jeffrey. Mike often dropped hints that he had friends in heavy places, although people like Chris Stamp of Track Records were skeptical. Mike could go into quite detailed fantasy. Indeed, the evidence is circumstantial, although it becomes more compelling as the story goes on. For openers, Mike's efforts had resulted in Jimmy being one of the first rock acts signed to Warner's reprise label, established solely for the benefit of Frank Sinatra to lure him away from Capitol Records. At a Warner's reception for the band subsequent to the signing, Neville Chester saw somebody sidle up to Mitch. I remember overhearing a conversation between Mitch and some strange-looking gentleman who gave Mitch a telephone number and said, If you're ever in trouble in America, you ring this number. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will begin the deep dive into July of 1968 of the Hendrix story, including the Woburn Music Festival, along with more about the recording of their third album, Electric Ladyland. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you.